I need Paul over here for that. Okay. Paul is the one that's the intro. Karen? Well, I, I need to spread a few things out. Yeah, that's fine. Karen? Karen? Yes. Yeah. I never got those. had 
one-room schools as part of their developing system of education. But Iowa is really unique. We have had more operating one-room schools for a longer period of time than any state. More one- and two-room schools listed on the National Register. More that are preserved as some type of museum facility. Um, every county in Iowa has at least one, what I would call, well, every country school museum is not. Some are a little nicer than others, but any effort that's been made to save a country school and preserve it as a museum is very significant and worth worthwhile. So I guess the first question that comes up with many people, why did Iowa have so many operating one-room schools? And at the peak, we had 12,623 operating one-room schools at the turn of the last century. The reason Iowa had so many schools, we had the richest soil in America. And immigrant families coming into Iowa could live and support a family on 80 acres of ground. Early on, Iowa was divided into the 99 counties. Uh, the traditional size county had 16 townships. But Iowa also, early on, even before we came, became a formal state, uh, decreed, the territorial legislature decreed that no child should have to walk more than two miles to get to a country school. And so uh, that was a mechanism that put, uh, put our state into a position to have huge numbers of operating one-room schools. The pioneer families coming into Iowa valued education. And they wanted their children to have an opportunity to go to school. Are we having trouble with the audio? Well, anyway, they, uh, they valued education. They wanted their children to go to school. They put a priority. And as a result, usually the first public building in a given township area was the public school. In many places, even the, the school came in before the church. And in many cases, the school was used during the week for education and then used on um, the weekend for church services. So with that, background, what, what I'd like to do today is give you uh, some numbers and give you some bios on men and women that really made a difference for public school education in Iowa and on the national level. Uh, This is the map, and again, uh, I'm sure you can't see it, we'll have it spread out up here, but this is the map that was published in the 19, or 1895 Agriculture Yearbook, and they put a dot on this map for every school building in Iowa, including one-room schools and consolidated schools, high schools, and 
and the dots don't mean much, uh, but the significance, I think one of the significant features on this map, every county in Iowa is listed and the number of schools in that county in 1894 is listed. And in Henry County, we had 107 schools operating in 1894. But even more significant, uh, and I, again, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, in 1894 in Iowa, about 40 some years after Iowa became a state, we had 13,400 33 schoolhouses. We had 28,301 teachers and we had 687,150 students going to school in Iowa in 1894. Well, I wonder how that compares with 2021, and I'm guessing maybe some of you might be surprised. Uh, we probably have slightly more school buildings if we count all the public and private elementary schools, junior highs, senior highs, consolidated schools. My estimate estimate is maybe we have uh, 14 to 15,000 school buildings in Iowa today compared with 13,000 um, in 1895. In 1894, we had 28,301 teachers teaching in Iowa schools. Today, uh, we probably have over 33,000 teachers teaching in public and private schools in Iowa. So we have, and, and we probably have, and again, it's, it's hard to get exact numbers, but I would estimate a little more than a half million students, 500,000 students going to public and private schools in Iowa. So we had fewer teachers, but more students going to school in Iowa in 1894 than we do today. The value, and this was surprising to me, the value of those school buildings in 1894, and these are numbers, I don't know how they came up with them, from the Department of Agriculture, 15,110,494. That's the value of the school buildings in Iowa in 1894. Today, uh, I don't know, but I'm guessing the school buildings we have are probably worth considerably more than $50 million if you add them up. Okay, those are some numbers. Uh, I'd like to kind of switch gears and talk about some people. And we'll see if we can make, okay. The man on the left, Henry Saban, and the man on your right, Homer Sear, are two of the people that really uh, shape early education in Iowa. And uh, uh, Mr. Saban was really ill-equipped to do that. He grew up in Massachusetts. Got a BA degree from Amherst College. 
took a job in education in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Illinois, and then became superintendent of schools in Clinton in 1887. Uh, he started networking with Mr. Seary through meetings of the Iowa State Teachers Association. They got to know each other very well. And in those days, uh, the position of State Superintendent of Public Instruction was elected. Saban was well known uh, by a lot of the other school administrators in Iowa. They said, Henry, we need your leadership. We want you to run as State Superintendent of Public Instruction. So, Saban agreed to do that, was elected. But then he quickly realized that the biggest part of his job would be supervising the more than, well, more than 11,000 one-room schools that were operating in Iowa as he became superintendent. Mr. Saban didn't know anything about the one-room schools. So what do you do? Well, like a good PR man following the four-step process, the first thing he did was to send out a survey. He surveyed the other county superintendents, asked them what they felt were the biggest problems facing public schools, one-room schools in Iowa. He got that feedback. And it was useful, but the main thing Satan decided to do was to travel throughout Iowa. So he spent his first year as state superintendent traveling around Iowa, looking at the one-room schools, trying to find out what was going on. Well, he was very disappointed. Most of the buildings were ramshackles, and again, we. Uh, we had operating schools in Iowa before Iowa became a state, so some of these buildings were over 40 years old. Even more disappointing was the curriculum, or the lack of curriculum, what the teachers were doing. Teachers really uh, did what they wanted to do. And Saban was determined that he was going to put an end to that. So, one of the first things he did in year two, he drew up some floor plans. What should a one-room school look like? What should be included in the building? And he published these in the state superintendent's biannual report, sent it out to the county superintendents. The county superintendents shared it with the township trustees. And um, the school buildings gradually improved. And some of the schools that Saban visited didn't have any outhouses. So what were the kids to do? They ran into the cornfield and they had to go to the bathroom. Some had one outhouse shared by boys and girls. Saban said no. Every country school will have two substantial outhouses. So that was one of the changes that he, he brought about. But even more depressing was the lack of information held by the country school teachers. So one of the next things Saban decided to do, we're going to publish a book, booklet with all the laws in Iowa adopted by the legislature that impact one room schools. So we got that out. Next thing, well, we need a standard kind of curriculum. So we produced a teacher handbook with a model sample curriculum, what courses should be taught, when they should be offered, the schedule, and again, he sort of depended on the county superintendents to, once he got it into the biannual report, got it out to the county superintendents, uh, 
they were, it was up to them to uh, get it out to the teachers, but some of them couldn't do it. They didn't have printing facilities, and that wasn't one of their priorities, so they could convince the legislature to provide additional printing money so every teacher could get a sample handbook. Well, how are you going to train teachers then to run this, run these schools? We had one normal school in Iowa, Cedar Falls, Iowa State Teachers College. And of course, um, other, well, Saban's idea, he went to the legislature, we need to create more normal schools in each part of Iowa. Well, some of the colleges didn't like that. Private colleges, maybe Iowa Wesley, but fall in the category. They wanted to train teachers. So the legislature did not take Saban's idea. So Saban worked with his friend Homer Sir. Said Homer, we need to develop a normal school program in each high school, well, at, at least in every, one, one high school in every county, usually in the county seat town. So we started the normal school in counties around Iowa. And this was a two year program beyond high school graduation. So if uh, a young girl wanted to go into teaching, she could go to the county seat town, take some additional training, and qualify for a certificate. Well, the next thing that Saban said, we need to be sure that the kids that go through the normal school program are learning. So we're going to have to test teachers after they take their normal school classes whether it be uh, during the regular school year or during the summer, we're going to give them a test and see if they learn the material. And he said the teachers that do well on their test, if they score 90% or more, they will have a first grade teaching certificate and they will be able to earn more money than a teacher that scores 85% to 90% in that range. Those we'll call second grade certificates, and then if they score less than 75, that's a provision or a third grade certificate. And if somebody scores that low, they have to work their way up to the second grade and then hopefully to the first grade. So we have a structured system of certification to motivate kids, primarily girls, to do well, to study hard, and to pass their exam. So that was a structure uh, that Saban and Searley put in place across Iowa. Uh, Saban was active in the National Education Association. People came to the NEA meetings and said, we have a problem with rural schools. So the NEA said, well, we'll appoint a committee, a committee of 12. And we'll put Henry Saban in charge of the committee of 12 because he's developed this system of education and teacher handbooks, curriculum guides that really didn't exist anywhere else in the country. So that was the impact Saban and Sierra had. Now, to be fair, we had some young women that were doing an outstanding job. Jessie Field was a precocious young girl and rather than sitting at home during the summer and playing marbles or 
taking care of her dolls or helping her mother, she decided she wanted to go with her father, Henry Field. He went out and had meetings with farmers to teach them how to grow corn and how to make their farms more productive. So she did this several years. She went away to college, but people knew that she was a good student and they said, Jesse, why don't you come back to Iowa and teach in the Goldenrod School? So Jesse came back, started teaching in the Goldenrod School, became very frustrated. Not enough time to do everything. But she felt boys and girls needed to learn. So she said, we'll have the boys come to school, stay after school on Monday and Wednesday. We'll call that session the Boys Corn Club. And we'll have the girls stay after school on Tuesday and Thursday. We'll call that the Girls Homemakers Club. So she started teaching the boys how to evaluate crops, animal husbandry. She taught the girls homemaking, how to do sewing, how to help their mothers out. And gradually, this program, done after school with the Golden Rod School in Page County in Southwest Iowa turned into what we recognize today as the 4-H Club movement. And it's recognized, uh, the Golden Rod School is recognized by the National 4-H Foundation as the birthplace of the 4-H program uh, broadly represented throughout Iowa. Well, let's talk about a couple of other women. Uh, May Francis, Agnes Samuels. Uh, up until 1923, uh, no woman had ever been elected to statewide office in Iowa. Uh, Homer Searley, Saw, he was a state superintendent, saw what Mae Francis was doing uh, up in Butler, Bremer, Bremer County, and she was doing an outstanding job. And she said, she said, May, why don't you come and be the supervisor of rural schools? We need somebody that has good background, uh, a good track record helping rural schools. They agreed to do it. She would spend her years traveling around Iowa, visiting rural schools, helping people uh, with problems that she had experienced when she had been a one room school teacher. Well, in 1923, uh, we had a primary for state superintendent. We had uh, the incumbent, P.E. McClanahan, he decided he wanted to run again. The director of vocational education wanted to run. May Francis said, well, I can run too. And so May Francis decided to run. And you may know in 1922, uh, when this election was held in November, uh, women had the right to vote. So that helped May. This is an interesting card, and I, I hope maybe you can read it, but the issue, 1923, what are we going to do with all these one-room schools? We have lots of problems in one-room schools. Well, McClanahan and the Director of Vocational Education, we have to continue to consolidate. We need to bring the kids in the town where we'll get a better education. They said, no, we've got to work to improve the one-room schools. 
make them better. Farmers cannot afford to build new consolidated school buildings. They can't afford it. And in 19, the early 1920s, crop, pipe, crop prices were going through the floor. The depression that hit the stock market in 29 was already underway in Ireland. So, when they had the Republican primary, they tabulated the votes, and they, Francis, won by a margin, a big margin. And then they had another woman she ran against in the Democratic, uh, a Democrat in the general election, and uh, the Democrats were pretty weak, so they ran, won a landslide election. Well, uh, the Iowa State Teachers Association, who was controlled by superintendents, they didn't like the attention given to rural schools. They wanted somebody that would consolidate the schools, build bigger schools in cities and towns where the superintendents that they represented were in charge. And so they went out and recruited a perfect candidate to run against May Francis, Agnes Sanders. Agnes grew up in southwest Iowa, small town, Silver City. She uh, attended a one-room school, got her degree from the University of Nebraska, started teaching in a one-room school, worked her way up and was on the extension staff at the University of Iowa. So Agnes had a statewide following, uh, had background with rural schools just like May did. Well, they counted the votes. It took a week to get the tabulation, close election. Agnes won by less than 2%. And May Francis was defeated. But well, again, she went on to have a very successful career to earn a PhD at the, Univers or at the University of Texas, uh, came back to Iowa. <coughs> but, as you can see here, Agnes cared about rural schools. And here she's visiting a school in Polk County, a one-room school. She prided herself. Uh, she uh, didn't ignore the one-room schools but also supported the agenda of the state, uh, of the county, uh, well, the Iowa State Teachers Association. May had come up with a program uh, called the Standard School Program, where schools were evaluated. If they scored high on the checklist, they got, if they scored 80%, or more on the 100-point checklist, they were deemed to be a standard school. And they got a door plate. It looked like this. They could hang up on the outside of their door. And I'll leave this up here. You can come up and look at it. Iowa Standard School. And it's a miracle how the legislature, how uh, May Francis got the legislature to fund a program, but the legislature kicked in $125,000. Part of it would go for this nice brass metal door plate. Part of the money, about 50% of the money, would be used by teachers to improve the curriculum, purchase materials of their choosing. But then the other half, were, could be used to improve rural teacher salaries. So a teacher in a one-room school that qualified as a standard school got that double boost. Well, uh, when Angus Samuelson took over, the people said uh, in the rural school said, well, we're already a standard school. What, what more can be done? And Agnes said, well, we can create a superior school program. 
And if a standard school scores 90% on the evaluation, they'll get another door plan. Superior school. They can put that above the standard school on the outside of their building and show everybody in the neighborhood this was an outstanding school. Well, these standards were pretty tough. Not many people can qualify as a superior school. We did get close to uh, close to 28 thousand standard schools in Iowa in the mid-twenties, but we only had 53 schools that qualified as superior schools. So a very high standard, uh, but again an indication that Agnes Samuelson cared about rural schools and wanted to help them improve. The other thing that Agnes did, she wanted, and feedback she was got, given, kids need to take these standardized tests that they had to take to graduate from eighth grade to go to high school. Some of the kids were worked hard, took them seriously, some of them maybe didn't. So they said, Agnes, what can we do to motivate all the kids to take the 8th grade exam? She said, well, we'll create the Felt Eye Program. Here's an example of the Felt Eye that Agnes Samuelson put in place. I is for Iowa. Gold is a color for corn, our most important crop. So she uh, got these felt eyes produced and then turned the job over to county superintendents. Every child that scores above 80% on their standardized test will be given a felt eye. They can put this on their jacket, put it with their eighth grade certificate diploma, use it however they want it to. So again, a very unique kind of program that I don't think was done anywhere else in America. So, still have a few more minutes? Okay, well we'll speed up. <laughs> We usually don't associate vocal music with one-room school, but Iowa, again, led the nation in the development of a local music program. The man behind it, Charles Fullerton, who was on the faculty at Iowa State Teachers College. He was in the music department. He wondered, what are the kids doing? Who's teaching kids the same in the one-room school? So. Mr. Fullerton went out, visited the schools, disappointed in what he saw. Most teachers, they couldn't sing. They didn't have any background in vocal music, so the kids, it was kind of ignored. So, Fullerton said, well, we'll publish a book, a song book, that lists the songs that children should know. And he had songs for, ele for elementary schools, graded schools, town schools, but he also had songs for the kids in the one-room school. The only curriculum book I've seen that has materials for the one-room school in the same book with the material for the graded schools. He said once kids learn to sing this music, become part of the rural chorus in Iowa. And you can, they can perform at the county fair at the eighth grade commencement. And people at the Iowa State Fair heard about this program and they said, Mr. Fullerton, why don't you invite the kids 
that are part of the Rural School Chorus of Iowa to come to Des Moines on the last day of the state fair and put on a concert. And Fullerton said, okay, that's a good idea. They'll give some more recognition to this program and to the kids. So in 1930, he invited kids to come. Well, they had 50,000 kids from 73 counties showed up on the last day of the fair. They performed their concert outside. It was too, too crowded to go inside, so they performed it out there, outside. And the state fair officials were delighted. Biggest crowd they've had in years on the last day of the fair. So they did that for four years. Well, in Chicago, we had the World's Fair. 1933, they heard about Fullerton's kids singing at the State Fair and said, Mr. Fullerton, we invite you to bring your students to the World's Fair. And Fullerton said, well, I don't know how many can come. That's a long ways away. But he performed and there were 50-some kids from Iowa entertained people. Chicago World's Fair in 1933, a popular attraction. <coughs> I'm guessing many of you have heard of our next person, Austin Palmer, the traveling penmanship man. Grew up in New Hampshire, traveled doing penmanship lessons across America, came to Cedar Rapids to form a business school. We had penmanship in country schools and other schools in Iowa and across America, Spencerian. But Spencerian had lots of curly cues, flowery form of penmanship. The boys didn't like it, the teachers didn't like it too much, Palmer tried it out in New York City with Catholic schools with boys. The boys loved it. They could get it done. They didn't have to screw around doing this flowery, flowing form of penmanship. And the rest is history. If they liked it in New York, it would go other places. And here is one of the first Palmer method of handwriting. Published in San Francisco, in Chicago, and in New York, spread across America, starting in 1906, lasted through the mid 1960s. The Palmer method of penmanship. Today, we maybe have cursive writing in a lot of the schools, maybe not. What's more important today? Keyboard skills. We've got to teach the kids to run the computers. The Palmer's method of penmanship spread across America. Well, maybe some of you know Grant Wood. Iowa's most famous artist. But what most people don't know is that Grant Wood went to a one-room school. Grant Wood taught in a one-room school. And this is Grant Wood with a hat on his head outside the school that he taught in in 19, I think it was 11, 12. Well, Grant Wood also painted the most significant painting of a one-room school done in America in the 20th century, and I, I picked it. That is by far the best painting I've seen. And you can see the 20 year span. Here, Grant Wood in his one room school. Grant Wood painting with his painting, Arbor Day, painted as a tribute and a gift to a teacher that he taught with at a junior high in Cedar Rapids. This teacher had taught at this particular school. 
The school no longer stands. It's near the airport in Cedar Rapids, but it was a real school, and it was given as a trip. And as Paul mentioned, Arbor Day ended up on the Iowa Quarter, a second line for the most significant painting of a one-room school done in the 20th century. Grant Wood uh, probably was the only, well, one of the few people that started his career in a one-room school, taught in a junior high, was on the faculty at the University of Iowa, led the regionalism movement, outstanding artist. And here is his painting. And the thing I guess I like about this painting, if you look at it carefully, it's really three-dimensional, full of symbolism. You can look at that painting, the rolling hills in the background keep rolling, rolling, rolling. So we've got a three-dimensional painting full of symbolism, which we don't have time to go into. But again, something that had a national impact uh, across America. Here's another piece that Grant Wood did, another tribute or a gift to a, another junior high teacher in Cedar Rapids. Rolling Hills and again the three-dimensional look. Well, uh, let me conclude one more minute. Uh, many people assumed all the one-room schools, public one-room schools in Iowa, were closed, and they were intended to be closed in the mid-60s. But Amish and Mennonite started moving in, so they started operating one-room schools. Sometimes they took over the former public one-room schools. But Wapsie Valley and Jessup said, we'll operate public one-room schools for Amish children. And today, they operate seven up in Buchanan County. Seven public one-room schools attended by Amish children. They hire certified teachers, but the Amish control or have a major influence on the curriculum. No technology, no computers. They approve the reading series, but we have this system of seven public one-room schools, and then there are 11 private one-room schools for Amish. So Buchanan County in Northeast Iowa is the only place in America where we have this dual system of public, private, one-room schools for Amish children. And as long as we have Amish and Mennonite families living in Iowa, we will have one-room schools operating in Iowa. Thank you. We'll have an opportunity for questions at the end, but we have one more presenter we wanted to have time for. So I'd like to introduce Aaron Kimsey to come forward. He is with the Henry County Historical Preservation Commission. Did I get it right? Okay, so Aaron, please join us. I'd like to 
just start off by uh, giving a little sales pitch. Um, the rule, the Preservation Commission is, we're finally going to be launching our book, hopefully by in April for $35. Um, and afterwards, after this talk, I can get your phone number or email or the best way to contact you, and we can hopefully get get some books out. And buying buying this book or not, you'll be helping. You'll also be helping the Preservation Commission fund other projects, and as well as being able to you know further enlighten yourselves on public on wandering schools here in the county. So who am I? Um, my name is Aaron Kinsey once again. I received my BA in Classics and a minor in History from Monmouth College. I volunteer at the Harlan Lincoln House. I serve on the Preservation Commission, and I'm very passionate about public history. So, Henry County Rural Schools, in 1960, for the first time in 125 years, no rural school districts would be opening for the spring school year. Um, Douglas number seven, Jefferson Township in the Wayland area was the last one to close. Uh, in 1889, high point for the number of rural schools in Henry County was 108. 1858 to 1859, the first county superintendent was Samuel Luke Howe. And in 1966 to 1975, the last county superintendent was Howard Ortmeyer. Um, I found uh, this information slide, or contract for teachers, to be very entertaining. Um, because I, I would have never thought of this being something in a teacher contract at all. Um, so wash windows and clean classrooms with soap and water once a week. I don't think that's going to fly in 2021 washing once a week because I start working in a school district and it's every every day everything has to be cleaned, you know, Clorox down, bleach down. So washing once a week, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, check the outhouses daily using old magazines and stuff like that. <laughs> well, that's probably not the best bathroom, but a, for women, a bathing costume, bloomers for cycling, um, Skirts to slit to expose the ankles and muscle extensions over 10 inches. Uh, for men, a detachable collar and necktie removed from the shirt. Shirt sleeves unlinked and rolled. Hair closely cropped unless having a baldness disease. Um, <laughs> and, um, smoking of cigarettes, use of spirits, and feet quanting or cool in public dance halls, marriage or other unseemly behavior. <laughs> by women teachers, um, and then joining any feminist movement or such 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 as the suffragettes is, you know, the immediate conduct for that is immediate dismissal. So they were very not happy if you're trying to fight for the right to vote. So it's pretty stiff stuff. Um, Beth, the Bethany School in Baltimore Township. Just picture this. I'm not much of a architectural historian by any means, but just having everyone kind of in there, the board, the chairs, you know, where you do your cooking, you know, and cleaning for any other activities, it just really puts into perspective how much education has changed in the last two centuries. Uh, here is Sherman in Canaan Township, and I think further in the slide you will see someone turned one of these one room schoolhouses into their home, actually, and it's actually really quite interesting. Uh, here is Colfax in Canyon Township, and what I guess I failed to realize is Henry County was once split up into you know these different different townships, and I never realized that. And I thought you know you just have one one room schools here and there, but I never realized that there was an organization to it. You'd have some in the northwest part of the county, you know, and then so on and so forth in the center, and it really really opened my eyes to know that there are so many one room schools at one point. My mother actually grew up in a one-room schoolhouse, whereas Mr. Sherman said it was more of a public one-room schoolhouse. And just to see that shift from the 60s into the 70s, of uh, you know moving into a you know the school district as we or schools we know know of today. Um, this one should be very familiar to you all. It's um, Colfax of uh, Canaan Township, and it's on the Midwest uh, Old Thrasher's Camper Grounds. And as you go along, 
along the trolley, you don't be able to see it. Um, West, Plus Lawn, West Pleasant Lawn Center Township uh, moved to the North, North Village at Midwest Old Freshers. East Highland Center Township, uh, and then it says Charlotte Davis attended East Highland. I'm not sure who Charlotte Davis is, but you know, at least she's noted in the photograph. Union or South Mount Pleasant Center, Center Township. And it was photo, the photo was taken in 2012, and from probably when this photo was taken, it's recently demolished. And here is an old piano, <coughs> and I'm not sure if that was moved out, but this is just a little bit of a look on the inside of the school. Here's some old desks, and there they were donated to. Henry County Heritage Trust, and you can see them there, and you know, actually have that tangible little bit of history. Uh, Fairview number eight, Jackson Township. Um, here is a picture of students and the teachers uh, making some lunch. Uh, probably a much more heartier lunch than what they what they serve in schools now, but uh, bread making and having to always clean that stuff right after not having a dedicated staff to, you know, be in the kitchen and clean stuff afterwards must have been a real extra add-on for the teachers. Greenwood or in Fairfield, Fairview number eight, Jackson Township. Um, Fairview number eight was moved to Greenwood number one site in 1953. After closing in 1961, the building was used as a community center. Elm, and here's Jefferson Township, um, and by the looks of it, it got turned into a house. Oak Grove in Marion Township. Lee Township, which is New Lon Lee Town, or in New London. Fairview uh, in Salem Township. Brown Grove in Scott Township. Looks to be winter, and they're probably just outside enjoying recess or some sort of break. Mask free, you know, probably was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Maple Grove in Tippecanoe Township, and uh, this was Donald Young's first teaching job. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that name rings a bell to anyone. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oakland Mills in Tippecanoe Township. The picture was taken in 1927 from, and the teacher is Miss White. Uh, this is the same photo, Oakland Mills, Tippecanoe Township, but um, Helen converted the Oakland Mills school to her home, and this photo was taken in October of 1974. Trenton School in Trenton Township, I'm not sure, I don't go to Trenton much, but I'm not sure if that's not there anymore. But that one looks to be, you know, an actual two stories. So Webfoot in Trenton Township. Crawford in Wayne in Wayne Township. And um, don't forget you can come see me after the talk and after questions and I'd love to get people's names and numbers and information and hopefully you know, we can get you some, get you guys some books. So and thank you once again. All right, any questions that you have? We have a few minutes left for either Bill or Aaron. Yes, go right ahead. I want to know from Aaron what delights him most about country schools. Um, you get a question? Why don't you come up here? Oh. Just because we have people online, it'd be easier to hear. <laughs> Wait, what's the most fun? What's the most delightful about a country school? Uh, <laughs> I guess just the way they look and going up through the school system from what it once was, you know, the one room schoolhouse into, you know, our modern yeah. community school district is my history. Because, you know, that's my, my history and that's where, you know, the education came from. It's just really, really interesting to see and reflect back on those times. And you know, and having that personal connection through my mother, who was in a one-room schoolhouse for a time. So, and that's, and 
I just, I love all sorts of history. It's, you know, anything's really entertaining, so it's all good. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank uh, both Bill Sherman and Aaron Kimsey uh, for enlightening us a little today on the country schools and interesting pre uh, presentation. <clears throat> I know we've learned a lot about our educational heritage here in the state of Iowa uh, from their uh, talk. But I also want to invite you to our final session. It's hard to believe they're over, but March is coming to an end. And that, of course, will be next Tuesday. But this is kind of interesting in that we're going to meet here uh, for a 6 p.m. program, uh, not, not at noon, at 6 p.m. And we're going to be welcoming Patricia Essick from Atumwa, and her topic is going to be Nancy Drew and the Ghost of Ladora, Iowa. Now, I've got a little trivia for you. Where the name of Ladora came from was, as Bill said, usually they would build the school first. Well, there was an educated a woman in town, and she said, well, let's raise the standard here, and let's name the town after three parts of the musical scale. Mm -hmm. So she named it La, Do, Ra. <laughs> so a little, little trivia today. <laughs> now the best thing is that Patricia is a, an alumna of Iowa Wesleyan University. So we, we'll give her a good welcome, won't we? She majored here in history and education. She's a retired librarian there in Ottawa. And I know, I've, I've seen her presentation on Nancy Drew, and I know you're going to like her a lot. So again, if we could give a round of applause for our two presenters today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Thank you.